This is episode 209 of the Stem Cell Podcast, Cell Science at the Allen Institute, with Drs. Ru Gunawardane and Caitlin Gerben. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back in this new year to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. Like I said, it's 2022. Happy New Year to you all. And it's starting off with a bang. It's a new era, ladies and gentlemen. I am announcing here for the first time, officially, the commencement of Arun Sharma's own independent lab at Cedars Sinai. Congratulations, my friend and partner. I'm looking forward to a lot of independent and stellar work coming from your group. Really appreciate it, man. It's uh, it's um, hard to believe that I've finally gotten to this point. As we all know, in academic science, it takes a while to get here. So obviously very thankful, very grateful to everybody for helping me out and getting things started. I'm excited to, to get going. Yeah, you're rolling now. I can't wait to see what you do next, my man. A reminder to you all that the ISSCR 2022 annual meeting is taking place virtually and in person from June 15th to the 18th in San Francisco, and abstracts are due by February 9th. Arun and I are excited to attend, and we'll be sharing the Stem Cell Podcast's plans in future episodes, and we hope to see you all there. Today, we have Drs. Ruguna Wardani and Caitlin Gerben from the Allen Institute for Cell Science on the podcast to talk about their work using human-induced pluripotent stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in stem cell news that's coming right up. But first, take your human pluripotent stem cell cultures further with MTZer Plus from Stem Cell Technologies, the most widely published medium for feeder-free human ES and IPS cell maintenance is now formulated for enhanced performance and versatility. MTZer Plus reduces medium acidosis for more stable cultures all weekend long. To learn more, visit www.stemcell.com slash mteaser plus. And yes, while I am very excited about starting up my own lab, you know, this year, or late last year, we are, of course, in the middle of a international pandemic, as we're all very well aware of. Some of the work that I did recently was actually using iPS-derived cardiomyocytes, like what we're going to be talking about today, to model the infection mechanisms of the coronavirus on human heart cells. And indeed, you know, we're still here. COVID's still going on. We've got the Omicron variant going on right now. And certainly there's still a number of great studies and great papers that are coming out in the stem cell field that are helping us dissect some of these COVID-centric mechanisms. So the first paper I'm actually going to talk about here in the new year is, of course, a COVID paper. And this is a cell stem cell paper that just came out. A clinical and translational report, and it really is, I would say, clinical and translational. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 infects the human kidney and drives fibrosis in kidney organoids. Um, so this is coming from the lab of Raphael Kramen over there at University uh, Aachen, Aachen University in German, Germany. First author is Jitzke Janssen. And it's, I think, a relatively straightforward study showing uh, using iPS-derived kidney cells uh, that you can model the infection mechanisms of SARS-CoV-2 on kidney tissues. But the reason I, I really like this is because it, in a lot of the initial COVID studies, my own study included, we didn't really use a lot of clinical samples. Okay, and here we are, hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic, and we have a lot more clinical information about how COVID is actually manifesting in the different tissues of the body. And we know, we know kidney, kidney failure is observed during and after COVID-19. We're actually chatting about, you know, before the show, a friend of mine, a family friend of mine who is a pretty young guy, and he unfortunately has developed some kidney, kidney symptoms as well. So this is, it's long COVID, right? It's one of the manifestations of long COVID. But what they're hoping to figure out here is whether that kidney, those kidney symptoms and kidney failure in general is a direct effect of the virus or perhaps a, an indirect uh, immunological mediated phenomenon. Like we've heard, heard about the, the cytokine storm that happens in the context of COVID and you know all these immune cells attack the lungs. And even in some cases of the heart and in myocarditis, you have immune inf infiltrate getting in there in severe settings of COVID. So here they actually infected uh, kidney cells, primary kidney cells, and uh, were able to show in clinical samples that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is associated with an increased tubule interstitial kidney fibrosis in, in patient 
autopsy samples, okay? And then to model this, they took uh, human IPS-derived kidney organoids and infected these organoids with SARS-CoV-2. So then they did a ton of single cell RNA sequencing here, as you might expect, to actually show that there is uh, obviously injury, direct apoptosis, direct injury happening to these infected cells, and also actually dedifferentiation in the infected cells, and also uh, activation of pro-fibrotic signaling pathways. So fibrosis is a pretty significant phenotype here. Um, they dove down into the mechanism a little bit more and saw that the SARS-CoV-2 infection led to an increase in collagen 1 protein expression in the organoids. And the cool, you know, one of the cool parts of this paper was uh, reversing some of the phenotypes. So they actually introduced a particular protease inhibitor, a SARS-CoV-2 protease inhibitor, to actually all all alleviate the infection of the kidney cells uh, by the coronavirus. So this is showing that, yes, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus causing COVID-19, as we all know, can directly infect kidney cells. This is demonstrated through uh, autopsy samples and also through their IPS model. And then subsequently, this direct injury could uh, induce fibrosis. So this is, I think, a really important study, a basic science study, but perhaps helping us better understand some of these phenotypes associated with, with long COVID in particular. And unfortunately, this is something that is certainly a reality, long COVID, right? Yeah, it's a shame uh, that people of all ages are suffering with the sequelae this long after they've, you know, vanquished the disease itself. And to me here, the, the big takeaway, as you said directly, is that showing one that it's, it's this direct, not this immune-related phenotype. So showing that it's really directly uh, the, the, the coronavirus attacking these cells um, that's leading to that. And also, uh, of course, getting it up to the level of uh, cell stem cell, the therapeutic element that you might be able to address this. Now, it might be too late for a lot of patients out there looking like the Omicron variant and maybe subsequent variants may be targeting different uh, sites in the body. But nevertheless, I think this is a, another piece of evidence showing that as long as this uh, pandemic persists, we can apply these stem cell based models to try and unpack uh, what's going on with disease. And I I'm hopeful that moving forward, uh, we can similarly apply these models to try and not just address with cell therapy, which is the obvious idea, although it may be a long ways, but also maybe trying to, to, to model treatments, you know, model ways that we can, we can maybe rescue uh, these phenotypes, although that may be a lot to ask, I, I have hope. Yeah, you know, I, I've been really impressed and honestly pretty proud of the way the stem cell field has responded to the challenge of COVID and actually modeling some of these COVID related phenomena and mechanisms, infection mechanisms. You know, there's been so many really neat, useful papers that have told us a lot about how the virus is actually affecting different tissues in the body using different IPS derived organoids or primary organoids. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is uh, Shubing Chen's really great work that, you know, is from your neck of the woods in Cornell, uh, using a bunch of different IPS derived cell types to actually figure out which cells are susceptible to infection. And then a ton of cardiac papers, a ton of, you know, gut organoid work, you know, with SARS CoV 2 and now kidney work as well. So these have been really useful models, in my opinion. I'm pretty proud of them. You should be. And I can't wait to see the models you bring out, Arun. Pressure's <laughs> on, my friend. No pressure. You're already rocking it. Um, but yeah, the bottom line here, we're talking about uh, disease, right? I'm going to segue here a bit. And uh, part of the, the issue here is that we didn't really have an insight, right? The, the, the body's a black box. The virus gets in there and runs amok and in different ways in each patient. And part of the problem with the human system in general is that it's not an experiment, right? These are people. Um, and so we really, uh, it's a bit of a black, bo black box. We can't really see uh, what's going on inside. And particularly when you talk about lineage tracing, you know, part of the mystery of, uh, you know, maintaining steady state as well as uh, developmental organogenesis is how cell lineages give rise to all um, their progeny. And um, in vivo, in, in the human system, it's really hard to reconstruct that, right? In animal models, you have these transgenic or exogenous cell labeling uh, systems, and that makes it pretty straightforward. You label one cell, you can see all the daughter cells, right? Um, but in human methods, obviously, there's no intervention there enabling that. Uh, and so what do you use? You use these somatic genomic alterations, okay? Oftentimes, they're called a molecular clock. Uh, to trace somatic fates. 
um, with the idea that if you share a lot of uh, mutations or alterations, genomic alterations, then you're probably closely related temporally. And this has been applied in many different uh, contexts and using many different uh, approaches. There was mitochondrial DNA mutation, DNA methylation at, at specific uh, loci, um, allelic loss or at, at heterozy heterozygous loci, um, also SNPs uh, using genomic sequencing. But all of these are kind of, well, they're specifically unidirectional, not all of them, the, the DNA methylation, not always. Uh, as we're going to come to in a second, but most of these are these unidirectional measurements, and they use accumulated changes from birth, right, to infer these lineages, but that's a long time scale we're talking about since birth, um, and it's a slow rate of these alterations, our variable rate that really can't be predicted, um, and so th this, this is limiting. Uh, especially over a long time scale, or it only uh, allows really over these long time scales to unpack all the clonogenicity there. And it's been shown in studies of skin, blood, intestinal crypts, and the endometrium, that when you do see these lineage divergences, they've happened many years in the past, right? So any kind of recent cell uh, turnover uh, remains opaque. Um, so here, this is this idea of in vivo lineage tracing that uh, in this new paper out in Nature Biotechnology from Alexander Anderson, Trevor Graham, and Daryl Shibata, who are respectively from University of London, uh, the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, and the Keck School of Medicine at USC. Wow, these guys all across the map came together for this story to introduce this concept of fluctuating methylation clocks, right? And this idea is that there's these epigenomic alterations that reversibly change state. Picture a pendulum going from at any specific CPG locus, going from 0% methylation to heterozygous, 50% uh, methylation to 100% homozygous methylation, and then back again. Um, and by looking in aggregate, uh, using a pretty low-tech, these Illumina Epic uh, arrays, not low-tech, I will say, but I it would, it's not like the bleeding edge uh, technology. It's pretty well established and robust and not so expensive, um, so approachable. And uh, using these arrays to uh, measure in aggregate thousands of these fluctuating methyl methylation clocks at, at the CBT loci, um, they were able to verify this hypothesis of FMCs or fluctuating methyl meth methylation clocks being used uh, for lineage hierarchy. Um, and they uh, developed this mathematical methodology uh, for inference and extract ancestral information using these fluctuated sites, validating it um, using human intestinal crypts, um, also endometrial glands, as well as whole blood. Uh, to, to really discern these different lineages and also in the, in the context of some kind of like a patho, pathology in the, in the intestinal crypts, they looked at APC mutations uh, in the blood, they looked at uh, acute and chronic leukemia. So uh, a, a nice study introducing a new concept, a, a robust methodology coupled with this mathematical algorithmic, algorithmic method um, for inference uh, and then showing that it actually works. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great tool for looking at human stem cell systems and, and differentiation, di differentiation hierarchy um, that could be applied in, in many other uh, you know, organ systems as well as uh, uh, disease states. So I, I'm, I'm impressed uh, by this piece of work, a nice uh, methodology that they developed here. Yeah, absolutely. I think part of the reason why this is a, you know, nature biotech paper and a pretty high profile paper is the accessibility of the work, right? As you mentioned, this method relies on pretty inexpensive methylation arrays that have been around for a pretty long time. And if they're inexpensive, that means for one, they can be applied to a bunch of different tissue types. And two, a bunch of folks can use them across the board. So I'm always a big fan of democratization of technology. So this is great. Um, one limitation that they actually mentioned here is kind of an obvious one. You need pretty high quality DNA to actually do this kind of work, um, as you might expect. And actually, uh, 
from a pretty small amount of input material. So one limitation, but again, very big fan of the democratization and the, the accessibility of the technology. Yes, absolutely. You raise a good point that in some of the more precious stem cell systems where the cells are scarce or uh, not accessible or as accessible, of course, there's going to be limitations there. But like everything, you know, this is using these, these pretty basic commercial Illumina arrays uh, as the methods of detection improve, I wouldn't be surprised if, and I'm not saying single cell resolution, that doesn't exactly line up with this technology. It doesn't, it's theoretically even, but um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you could uh, increase the resolution here and, and minimize the input and expand into more, I would say, uh, difficult uh, systems. So like everything that we talk about on this show, Arun, this is really just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot of people that this will, uh, you know, seed an idea. Uh, and that's the great thing about uh, this, this uh, system we work in. All these techniques meet the ideas and the capacity in the, in the beautiful world of pluripotent stem cells. Absolutely. And, you know, if it's a technology that's accessible, then hopefully I can use it in my own lab, right? You know, I don't have that much money to start off with, but you got to start somewhere, right? You know what I mean? So absolutely. And like one other technology that hopefully one day down the road I'll adapt is the assembly technology, probably not in a, in a neuroscience context, obviously I'm not neuroscience, maybe in a cardiac context down the road. So the next paper I'm going to talk about is actually a cell stem cell paper. It's uh, another cell stem cell paper, actually dissecting the molecular basis of human inner neuron migration in four brain assembloids from Timothy syndrome. This is actually coming from the lab of a, a good friend of ours here on the show, Sergio Pasca, who's been on the show many times. In fact, his former student, Tomas of Khan, who's a good friend of mine, has also been on the show. I was actually chatting with Tomas about this particular paper. The first author is Fikri Berry, who I think has started up is their own lab in, in uh, Emory. And uh, Tomasa filled me in on that. Thanks, Tomasa, for the, for the tip. And yes, coming from Sergio Pasca's lab, who's an expert on cool new technologies, and in particular, organoids and assembloids, where you can combine different aspects and different regions of the brain together in these IPS-derived models to create a, a multi-tissue system, right? That's kind of the power. And the other thing is Sergio's lab and his own work has focused on Timothy syndrome for a long time now. I think it was actually, according to Tomas, one of his initial claims to fame back in the day when he was just starting up his own lab and becoming an independent researcher over, the, over at Stanford. And this is a, a, another paper in, in cell stem cell uh, that's following uh, the progression of that Timothy syndrome story. I think uh, Dr. Berry actually had a nature paper a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, also focused on Timothy syndrome and looking at some of the, the mechanisms of how this uh, neurological disorder actually arises, right? And diving down to the mechanism in this paper, they actually found that defects in inner neuron migration can actually disrupt the assembly of cortical circuits and actually lead to different neuropsychiatric diseases such as Timothy syndrome, right? And in their previous paper, they're actually using four brain assembloids that were derived by the integration of these cortical and ventral four brain organoids to, to, to look at a specific defect in Timothy syndrome. They actually found a, a really neat, interesting cortical inner neuron migration defect. And I was actually, you know, Tomas told me to take a look at some of the, the old papers and some of the videos in the old papers to actually get a better understanding of how this defect is actually visualized. And I thought it was just wild watching these neurons just migrate through the, the assembloids and just the, the, the tracing, like we're talking about lineage tracing, the tracking of these neurons was really pretty mind blowing to me. You know, some of these technologies that they're able to, to use in the Pasca lab to actually study the, the motion of individual neurons in these assembloids. And so they're using kind of these same approaches, these very similar technologies in these assembloids to study Timothy syndrome a little bit deeper and take an, another dive into the mechanisms of the disorder, uh, which is of course caused by a mutation in the L-type calcium channel or LTCC. Uh, here, they're actually finding that when you modulate using drugs, the L-type calcium channel, you can regulate the, the length of the motion of these neurons, you know, just how long they move, but actually not how frequently they move and migrate in Timothy syndrome, okay? And this defect in, they call it saltation, which 
according to Tomasov, is the the motion of these these neurons in these tissues. Uh, the defect of saltation is actually related to actomycin. Okay, as you might expect, actomycin is really important for cell motion, um, and in the defect itself, the, the frequency of that motion is driven by GABA sensitivity and actually can be restored by a GABA, uh, GABA receptor antagonist. Okay. So they actually dove into the mechanism, and actually figured out a way to kind of restore some of these migration and, and migration phenotypes that you would see in Timothy syndrome. Right. So it's a, it's a neat study utilizing really beautiful imaging and, and calcium imaging and also electrophysiology, as you might expect in these assembloids that the Posca lab has really pioneered and worked on for many years now. And one uh, of many stories in the repertoire and the, the, uh, the collection of the Posca lab focusing on Timothy syndrome and figuring out really the detailed mechanisms of how this particular neurodevelopmental disorder would arise. Again, talking about cool technologies, this is definitely utilizing a number of them. Yeah. And you said, uh, just now how it's just one in the collection. Um, I'm, I'm psyched to see circled back to the Timothy syndrome. I didn't know that, that he, that that's where he really came up. Um, and it's nice to see that he still holds that. I know he has a real commitment to neuropsychiatric disorder too. So I, I, I'm, I'm so excited to see everything this guy does. And it's one thing after the, not the other, but it makes me wonder, you know, cause he, I think, rightfully deserves most of the credit, I guess, for uh, assembloids and as like conceptually, or is certainly one of the first, if not the first to, to do it, um, publish it. So I wonder, you know, he's got all these papers coming down the pipe. Is there like a latency? Are other people working on assembloids? Because I would love to see some assembloids, Arun, hint, hint, get after it in other <laughs> organ systems. Is it just the brain that's just like so suited to it because of all the diversity of, of cell types and that are so closely juxtaposed and all, all the interneuron migration and intercalation. I'm just throwing words out there. But like, could we find some other assemblages? I know other groups are doing it, but I, I'm not even complaining. I just can't, I can't, I'm excited to see the other types of assemblages that come off the pipe. I mean, I can just imagine uh, how complex you could go with that, right, Arun? Absolutely. I mean, you are jumping the gun a little bit because, you know, dirty little secret that is something that i hope to do in the future actually is to work on some of these assembloids in a cardiac context i mean i know some folks who are actually yeah potentially using assembloids already in a cardiac context I and mean, we think about it the heart has like four chambers right what if you could make ventric ventricular cardiomyocytes a ventricular organoid and combine it with an atrial organoid and just create like a, a pseudo four chambered heart using these assembloids right i mean that's yeah that's that's in the works and other folks are working on other tissue types as well so you are absolutely right. This is this is happening, man. Putting some words together. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> you know, the thing is there with the, the all of what we're doing here is just trying to understand how how these things work and specifically how they work together. Right. We talked about lineage tracing at the, at the front of the show. Um, we talked about the comp the complexity of a virus and disease. And now here you're talking about this neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, so I'm going to stick with it. Segue here to an organoid story. That is also about uh, lineage tracing. And this is a story from Jay Gray Camp and Barbara, Trut Barbara Trutline, who are both um, in Basel, Switzerland. And the idea here is lineage tracing, again, as I said, but in a, in a more controlled system. So in experimental systems, you have much more, uh, ma many more options, right? And many approaches have been used for lineage tracing in these experimental systems. In single cell RNA-seq, most recently, uh, has been extensively used um, for looking at molecularly distinct cell types within organoids and, and trying to put them together in a kind of differentiation trajectory, right? You can identify the terminal cell types as well as the intermediates by their molecular signature and then delineate these differentiation paths using pseudotime. You know, there's, there's many different algorithms that have been developed such that probably the most popular uh, is the pseudotime analysis. Um, and that allows you not only to kind of infer the differentiation trajectory, but also the fate potential of many different cell types uh, and progenitors, right? Um, but although there's been many different, you know, strategies used for uh, that type of pseudotime analysis and trajectory analysis, it, it doesn't really substitute for true 
lineage tracing, right? Um, and so to that end, there have been a kind of a, a combination of single cell transcriptomic analysis with lineage um, tracing uh, by using reporter transcripts that have unique barcodes, right? These, these sequence barcodes, um, as well as using uh, scarring patterns like genomic scarring that you introduce a mutation using CRISPR-Cas9 and then look at all the, the daughter cells that contain that mutation. So there's been combinations using single cell genomics and lineage tracing, um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, they, they, are, they are not complete. Uh, in their ability to both identify the progenitor as well as the, the uh, derivatives. Um, and bringing into that the uh, imaging format, there's a, a lot of four-dimensional kind of light sheet microscopy that's been used as a complementary approach to try and actually visually identify these cells. Um, and while that allows for visualization, uh, you know, you don't really have the specific uh, genomic lineage tracing there and there. So here, this is a combination, a, a dual uh, approach that uh, doctors Camp and Trutline have developed. They call it eye tracer. It's a dual channel cell lineage recorder that enables both the clonal analysis um, of, of cells on, along the trajectory, as well as uh, temporal dynamics of cell fate establishment um, without having to do repeated rounds of labeling, you know, where you're um, in, in, in integrating some kind of uh, insult there to scar the genome and then track it. Um, and then they specifically apply it in a organoid system. Um, they uh, use cerebral organoids uh, and apply this eye tracer methodology to identify a specific window during which the fates are restricted. They also show a variation in, in the neurogenic potential of all the different neuron families. Um, and then, of course, they integrate this spatial trap. I mean, this is a, a, a whole uh, a medley of, of approaches that were combined here, spatial transcriptomics as well. They did this long-term 4D light sheet imaging uh, to actually look at lineage recording in space. Um, and they, using those methods, they were able to confirm that there was this clonality in the neuroepithelium. Um, and then they even introduced these uh, mosaic TSC2 mutations um, to show that they could introduce an insult there uh, as, as just like a little extra, a little spice there, and, and, and incidentally show that that does augment metabolism and delay neural development. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of things. I would say it's a it's a methods paper. It's a nature methods, not for no reason. It's It's throwing all these things together and showing how, uh, you know, how many things you could do uh, in this one cerebral organoid system and it unpacked a lot in that. But the, for me, the real takeaway, as we've been talking about, you know, assembloids in strictly in uh, the neural space, can we apply it elsewhere here? This is a, an approach that you can apply to any IPS derived culture system and then um, try and dissect the lineage uh, specification and trajectory um, in both normal or perturbed development of any cell type or lineage that you're interested in. So this is, a, I, I went with methods today, Arun, because I feel like these are two powerful tools that are really gonna, gonna uh, catch fire in the pluripotent stem cell space. Absolutely. And I, I really hope that Sergio is listening to this particular roundup because this is a specific technology that would integrate perfectly with the work that he's doing in Timothy syndrome, right? We're talking about tracing cell lineages and cell motion, cell movement, um, which is something that they're doing in their assemblies, right? So hope you're listening, Sergio, you know, giving you some free tips and free advice here. Uh, but certainly, yeah, very cool, hugely diverse range of technologies that are being utilized in this particular paper. The Troutline Lab obviously has a, has a significant expertise in computational biology. And I think she was actually the, one of the young investigators of the year for the ISSCR not too long ago. Mm -hmm. But yeah, integrating cerebral organoids, CRISPR, light sheet microscopy, single cell seek, all this good stuff. We love technologies here, right, Dylan? Oh, so much. I mean, it's a bit overboard on this, but I am not complaining uh, a, a real feast um, for, for us, you know, the real geeks for the tech. Uh, so speaking of the tech, you know, we're about to talk to two people who have a cell atlas. So let's get to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. But before we get there, I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies, who conducted a survey 
asking scientists to help highlight the hurdles to genome editing using CRISPR. You can read the survey report to learn about the most interesting insights on topics such as editing efficiency and downstream viability and how to overcome them in your research. Visit www.stemcell.com slash CRISPR survey results to learn more. All right, everyone, for our first episode of this new year, we have a special double feature. Doctors Ru Gunawardane and Caitlin Gerben are joining us. Dr. Gunawardane leads a group of researchers creating a collection of high quality gene edited stem cell lines to study cell organization and activities through live cell imaging. Prior to joining the Allen Institute, Dr. Gunawardane worked on assay development at Amgen, and characterized a kinase inhibitor for acute myeloid leukemia at Ambit Biosciences. Dr. Gerben's current work focuses on implementing cardiac differentiation methods and developing the cardiomyocyte pipeline using gene-edited iPSCs. And I should mention that Dr. Gunawardane had a very nice comment published in Nature Cell Biology in the end of November. It's still on the front page there, so you should check it out. It's called It's Time to incorporate diversity into our basic science and disease models. I don't know if we'll get to talk about it in the conversation here, but you guys should definitely check it out. A very interesting read. Now on to our guests. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Yes, thank you. Excited to talk about what we do at the Institute. Absolutely. So let's jump right into it. As Dalen mentioned, you're both working out at the Allen Institute, which is really a, a cutting edge nonprofit bioscience research institute in Seattle. And the cell science division at the Allen Institute or the AICS was actually launched to capture kind of a global view of human cells, developing these gene edited fluorescently tagged IPS lines that kind of form the, bound, uh, the backbone, really, of an openly available library of digital microscopy and computational models to predict cell organization. And we'll actually get to your work on developing these IPS reporter lines in a second, but why don't we actually start off broad? Since the Allen Institute is such a unique place, what, we wanted to get your perspective and your thoughts about why you decided to work there. Why did you decide to work at the Allen Institute, such a, a unique nonprofit research institute. So we'll start with you, Rue, and then maybe Caitlin, if you'd like to follow up. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, it's a really good one because it is a unique place that brings scientists, engineers, um, people working on various software tools together on one big mission. And that's a big reason that a lot of us joined is the mission, Paul's mission to change the world in a way, in a unique way that brings people together to help people in the community, the research community in particular. So specifically speaking for me, coming from industry where I was doing science to develop new drugs, new therapeutics for various diseases, I, I feel like really gaining a better understanding how cells go wrong is really important before we can figure out how to fix those cells and to make the therapeutics for that. So I was always curious from my earlier training through my career in industry, what, how do cells go wrong and how do we fix it? And the, the scientific mission for cell science was around how do cells work? What is the operating system of a cell? Can we understand that blueprint, right? So that we can understand how to, how to go in there and change the cell if we need to. So that scientific part of the mission was very exciting to me. Uh, the other parts that were exciting was the openness so if you work in industry, a lot of what you do is um, not public information. Uh, but with the Allen Institute, one of our driving attributes is that what we do is open to the research community. Uh, so that was exciting. It also means we can collaborate with a lot of people. We can share our data. We learn from others more in real time rather than waiting for publications. Uh, and the third part that was really exciting is to get to work with so many different uh, people with different expertise and backgrounds, but in a smaller culture, not a 10,000 people company, but a group of 50 to 60 people. It's kind of like an extended family. So those are kind of the three reasons um, that excited me to join the Institute. 
Uh, and turns out today is the seventh year anniversary of the Institute for Cell Science. So this seems like a, a good time to talk about that and reflect on it. Happy anniversary. Caitlin, Thank you. why did you, uh, why were you interested in joining Institute? Yeah, it's actually really fun to hear Rue's answers because I, I can relate to so much of that. Um, you know, I'm, I joined Rue's team on the Allen Institute for Cell Science and Stem Cells and Gene Editing um, right after I got my PhD. And I was really drawn kind of for similar reasons, like the team science aspect of, of the way that we work at the Allen Institute was really intriguing to me. Um, I've always really been drawn to interdisciplinary work. And I just think that there's some real magic that can happen when you bring together people of all these different backgrounds and kind of scientific disciplines to be able to work together. And I had experienced that in various forms, you know, throughout my graduate degree, but I also was just really looking for a place where I felt like I could come in and contribute and really work really closely with, with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's, you know, one of the first things that really stood out to me about the Allen Institute is that we have this team science approach. We're not just each working on our own projects um, and, you know, going to people when we need help, but truly like the projects are designed around the expertise that we have across the group. And there were so many days, um, you know, especially early when I started when I'd be in the lab working on a project with three of my colleagues and we're all kind of going back and forth together, hands-on working on the same project. And I think that is just a really fun um, and productive environment to be able to develop, especially as an early scientist. Um, another thing um, I was really drawn to was just the approach to big science. I like thinking big, big picture about problems um, and the types of questions that we can ask at the Ellen Institute with these kind of big goals in mind. I think um, are something that just is really exciting and again allows you to just kind of tap into uh, the skill sets of all the different unique people you have working on these projects and um, yeah just a it's been a, a really um, you know amazing place to kind of jump start my scientific career. Well you already had some pretty good momentum you're on a very exciting track having trained now in two powerhouse labs uh, formerly in Chuck Murray's lab at University of Washington uh, but both kind of pursuing the same um, amazing clinical promise of pluripotent stem cells for treating pathologies related to the heart. But every lab is different, of course. And your case, you moved from a uh, focus on, well, from what I saw uh, of your work there, it was focusing on, on, on graftment of cardiomyocytes. Um, and now you've moved to like a really big, big picture, kind of comprehensive understanding of the biology of the cardiomyocyte during differentiation specifically. Um, so, you know, in that decade or so span uh, between graduate school and your postdoctoral training, do you think that that shift kind of reflects a, a shift in your vision of how therapies will best get into the clinic? You know, is it like, have you kind of had the goalposts kind of move, so to speak? Um, if so, how, Rue, also, you know, judging from your move from from uh, uh, industry to, I would call this academic uh, science or philanthropic, whatever you want to institute science, uh, has, 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 have the goals changed big picture or personally, starting with you, Caitlin? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And you're right that in graduate school, I did a lot of um, cell transplantation of HESC derived cardiomyocytes and also tissue engineering. Um, and I, you know, I think ultimately the goal for a lot of us working in, in the stem cell field is some sort of therapy or um, model that can ultimately go and actually help improve people's lives. Um, and so I was really, you know, addressing that head on in my graduate work. But I think, you know, the more, <laughs> the more you dig and the more you do experiments, you learn that there's a lot of things we actually don't know fundamentally about the cells. And I remember... Um, some of the first conversations I had with Rue when, when I joined her team was just about asking these questions and really digging and trying to understand that, you know, if we don't understand at a really basic level, like what makes cells, um, you know, healthy, what makes them diseased, where do things go wrong, all these kind of basic fundamental questions, I think it's not that the goalposts have shifted, but I think it's a different approach of looking at the same problem that, you know, we're, we're kind of drilling down to the, the basics um, with the ultimate goal that, you know, the things that we're finding 
in our work now can be put forward towards people who are doing their own translational studies um, or disease modeling or you know what have you in, in the field. Ru, how about you? What do you think? Yeah, I, I can add to that saying in terms of what we are doing is kind of improving our fundamental understanding of the cell. And what stem cells allow us to do in addition that they have this amazing capacity that we can make different cell types. So there are lots of potential uh, clinical applications. Stem cells are also one of the more normal cells that we can use in the lab compared to what we've had in the past minus you know, 10 years, um, where usually those cells we've used to study biology to get the understanding that we do have up to now is based on pretty much cancer cells or cells from other species. Uh, so for the first time here, we can use human cells in the lab that are dividing, that we can follow, that are genomically also pretty normal, right? They're not transformed. So that I think was revolutionary that we had that and it happened to be around the time we started. Uh, so I think there are several technologies, including CRISPR and stem cells that allow us to do the work we are doing, that allow us to really figure out that, that operating system of the cell, right? So that they are normal, that they can divide, that they can become other cell types. It was just like, how could we not use this opportunity to dig deeper and figure out how does the cell work? And that leads into what we did after that, which is to use imaging to follow these cells as they do, they go about their business. Uh, I think watching the game is how we've described this in the past. Like if you were learning a new sport, you probably wouldn't learn very much the rules by looking at the stats or hearing a story about it. You wanna watch the game and maybe watch it several times to understand the rules, right? Same thing with cells. I think we are using live imaging. Again, the live piece is important. Uh, we've done a lot of studies in the past, not we, we as the community, where we fix the cells, we kill the cells. And there's a lot of information lost when you do that. So we want the cells to tell us how they operate. Um, and that was something I think kind of unique that we are doing. A lot of people are doing imaging, but doing live 3D imaging in stem cells that are normal, allow us to have that big picture while also collecting all the very detailed information. Yes. Yeah. So I want to actually ask you a little bit more about that, Rue, um, that work on fluorescent reporter IPS lines that you're alluding to. It's a, it's a huge collection that you have there at the AICS of different tag cell lines that are, as you've mentioned, are available for others in the scientific community to actually use. I've actually used some of the cardiomyocyte lines myself. Oh, cool. um, yeah, they're beautiful. I'm a big sucker for live imaging and beautiful contracting cardiomyocytes. So I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with them. Um, and of course, in addition to the cardiomyocyte stuff, you're, you've got some research on kidney disease, all different types of cell lines that you've tagged with different fluorescent reporters that you can use for live imaging, as you've alluded to. You can't get much better than live protein imaging, right? So, you know, tell us a little bit more about the, the rationale as to why you've decided to create this huge compendium of lines. You alluded to it a little bit, but it's a it's painstaking work to actually make these huge amount of IPS lines that are customized and fluorescently tagged. So what's the big picture vision as to why you want to use them? And talk about some of the, even some of the troubleshooting and some of the, the hardships that you've had in trying to make some of these lines. Sure. And Caitlin can definitely help me here. Um, so yeah, this has been a six year long journey. And the initial rationale for this is to understand how cells work. Let's do live imaging. But let's also use stem cells because of its amazing uh, potential for differentiating into other cell types, but also that they are normal and pluripotent. But what do we look inside the cell? Do you know what are we looking for? So we first said, let's look at the major structures of the cell. So you can think of this as if you want to go to a new city, you want to know all the landmarks. Where's the airport? Where's the hospital? Where's the police station? So to us, if you look inside the cell, that those are all the organelles. So if you look in a textbook, you would think we know where the nucleus is, where all the other components of the cell are. 
But usually this information has been gathered in the past, again, by killing the cell or at certain time points in a cell's journey. To do it in live cells, we needed to put kind of a beacon on those landmarks. And to do that, luckily for us, CRISPR was available. CRISPR allowed us to somewhat easily go into a human cell, go into its genome, and put in a tag so that we can now visualize all these organelles. Right? So we took a representative protein for that organelle and tagged it using CRISPR uh, editing, and we did endogenous editing here. Uh, and for the aficionados uh, who understand some of those details, it's more about we didn't want to just shove a ton of extra protein into the cell. Then we were not really going to understand a normal cell anymore again. So it was very important that the protein was endogenously tagged for us. And after we did that, we created about 100 clonal lines for each one line we want for each structure because of what you were alluding to. There are a lot of things that happen when you grow stem cells, when you edit. So we spend about six to nine months, and some, in some cases up to a year, doing quality control assays. And we have about 17 different things we look for in terms of, did we mess up the genome while we were editing? Did we somehow affect this organelle so it can do its basic uh, processes like cell division? Can it survive? Can it differentiate? Uh, and is the genome as a whole stable, right? Is it creating like an extra chromosome? Sometimes the cells do that when they're stressed. So we basically about 20 people, almost half of the Institute spend time looking at these cells, looking at multiple clones of these cells, growing them very, very gently. We baby the cells um, and looking under the microscope and making sure the tag is in the right place and lots of different biochemical um, and kind of uh, gen genomic assays to check for the cells. Um, and once we pick our favorite one, and again, it's a team approach, we come together and we talk about our different expertise and we rank them. And then we do it almost separately, different groups do it separately. And then we compare notes uh, and we pick a winner in a sense, and then release it to the community. So that's kind of the overall process. Uh, but yes, there have been lots of challenges on picking those assays. We work with the community to ask them if there are ER experts, what are the things you would look for? How would you tag them? What have people done in the past? So sometimes it takes about six months of work of pre-research before we even tag a line. So overall, probably a year and a half process from design uh, to release. Hmm. And Caitlin's been very much part of this <laughs> actual work of this. So Caitlin, on that note, once yeah. you get this whole painstaking nine months, a year, sometimes you finally have a candidate. Is it, are you just so done with that cell line and you move on to like another reporter line? Because I, I can remember making reporter lines. There was such gratification in having something work, you know, create a biological entity that doesn't exist on earth. And there it is living and carrying out its purpose. It's like such a thrill. And, and, you know, then comes all the biology, right? That you can use that tool for. Do you find that you're tempted to like follow down the track of working with the cell line? Or are you moving on to the next one? Uh, you know, a little bit of both. I think uh, there's certainly, you know, some lines that, you know, we brought through the process where like various clones or something were just harder to work with. And then usually like Ruth said, we'll rank and then end up with um, one that we all agree on as being the, the, the best one for whatever purposes. So by the end of the process, the best, uh, you know, the public release clone usually um, is not the one that we're frustrated about working with. So um, that, that's fine. But yeah, we actually, I mean, we develop the lines for the community, but we also use them internally for our own imaging and our own experiments. And so, um, you know, I think most of the lines we've we've taken through, you know, extensive additional imaging and, and research internally. Um, and for me, I'm focusing on cardiomyocytes, um, you know, of course, I'm involved in the testing and differentiation of all the different lines, but the cardiomyocyte lines in particular would be ones that we are often going back to 
Um, and, you know, we, we often in the team would have a few sets of lines that we kind of always have going or always in an incubator somewhere because we're using them for various experiments, whether it's testing differentiation protocols or doing uh, different sets of live imaging or time course imaging um, or RNA fish studies. Um, so there's definitely, a, you know, a lot of continuation with the lines, even after they've gone through the QC process and are released to the public. Yeah, so actually, let's talk a little bit about some of those papers and some of those experiments that you've been using the lines for. As you alluded to, it's not just making the lines, it's actually mm -hmm. utilizing them internally for your own research purposes. So you've put together some pretty nice papers using some of these fluorescent reporter IPS cardiomyocytes to look at cell states beyond just transcriptomics and integrating structural organization and gene expression and IPS cardiomyocytes to kind of get a full picture, like what you're alluding to, about what's happening live in the contracting heart muscle cell, right? And this was actually the foundation, it seemed like, of a great cell systems paper that came out last year, I think. Uh, this is omics and imaging to the max, and you developed this quantitative imaging-based platform for uh, automated classification of subcellular organization in these single cardiomyocytes. So, uh, Caitlin, tell us a little bit more about you know the project, the cell systems paper. And I'm an IPS cardiomyocyte guy myself, so. For me and for other cardiac biologists, how, I, how might we be able to use this data set in our own work? Yeah, um, great. So this was a really, um, you know, a big project across multiple different teams at the Allen Institute. And so, um, you know, I think it kind of drives home that team science approach where we had um, co-authors from almost every different team within the Allen Institute for Cell Science working on this. So that was um, you know, really rewarding process to be able to dive into different aspects of the analysis and imaging and, and cell differentiation. But um, as you kind of mentioned, so this paper, we were really trying to take a, a different approach at looking at cell state. Um, and of course, cell state, you know, you could say it is defined a number of different ways. And we kind of kept it a little bit open about what is what is really going on in our cells. And if you take, you know, a snapshot of your favorite gene or your favorite protein or your um, you know, image of, of how the cell looks, does that actually tell you the whole picture or is there, there more going on? Um, and of course we can all have our own hypotheses about this around our favorite genes that we think um, are important to drive cell organization or cell shape or cell size. Uh, but we wanted to, to really come up with a holistic platform to look at this across a large number of cells. And so, um, yeah, we did uh, imaging on using the alpha actinin 2 tagline. So this, if you know, if you're familiar in the cardiac field, this is kind of a classic marker um, protein that people will look at to look at how organized the sarcomeres are. And sarcomere organization is also often used as a proxy for maturation and function. And we know that, you know, this structure function relationship is so tightly tied in cardiomyocytes. And that's one of the reasons why we were really interested in looking at it in this system. Um, so we take that imaging data and then also wanted to look at the gene expression of, you know, key genes. And so, like I mentioned, you know, there's a number of ways to do this. You could either look at a ton of genes and a smaller number of cells, we chose to look at a really large data set of, you know, thousands and thousands of single cells, give them all, you know, a class, a, a classification for how organized the cell is, and then overlay that with transcript information. Um, and, you know, we found that it's, it's not quite as simple as, as you might think, you know, we have our, our standard marker genes, you know, as, you know, I remember learning even in early in graduate school, like the myosins are changing as the cells, you know, if you have ventricular cardiomyocytes, you've got these two that kind of switch and that changes and, and correlates with the organization, but that's not actually really what we found. And I think it's, it's kind of um, similar to looking at, you know, the shift that we have in the field with RNA sequencing. We're looking at all the bulk sequencing of tissues and cells in a dish and then once you start doing the single cell analysis, you realize that the story is actually a lot more complex. You may have these general trends that you see across populations, but if you just pull out a specific cell, it may or may not actually be, you know, fitting into that category. And so that's really what we looked at with, um, with this paper. And 
uh, one of the things that I think was really rewarding about this particular project is that, like you mentioned, um, we, we made this data set available. So all of the images um, that include the sarcomere tagging, so the alfactinin images, and the images of those same cells with RNA fish for the different transcripts, those are all available to be downloaded. You can find those through the paper, but we also have a platform on our website called the Cell Feature Explorer. And this is an interactive um, browser kind of plotting tool where you can go in, click on that data set, and it'll load 30,000 single cell images that are all annotated. And there's a plotting tool where you can plot based on the transcript abundance of a given gene, if we have that in the cell, the organization of the sarcomere, the cell area, right? So various different things. So it's really interactive in there as a way for people who maybe don't want to go through all the work to do all of that imaging and differentiation, or even if you're interested in, in cardiomyocyte biology and stem cells, but aren't working in a stem cell lab, right? We tried to, our best to make all of these you know, these images usable for people. So you can go in, play around with the data, you know, pull out different trends or ask questions and then download all that. And you're free to use that in your own research. Um, so I think that's a, a really good tool. Um, and in addition to that, we also have made all of the um, computational analysis tools fully accessible as well. And um, I know, you know, one thing we think about a lot is that there's a gap, a knowledge gap between uh, generating all these images and then actually having the computational savvy to like go through and, and go through and really ask those questions. And so we're trying within the Institute to put a lot of effort into making sure that these tools are actually accessible and usable to people. And um, so we have a number of different tutorials um, and workshops and webinars and stuff we've done online to try to help bridge that gap um, to make these image analysis tools easier for the, you know, the regular biologist to use, even if you don't know Python or R or have never used a terminal or don't even know what that is, right? There's, there's ways that you can go through and, and do these types of analysis um, in your own hands and hopefully like make that barrier a little bit smaller. Yes, I mean, the, ba the barrier there is big numbers for me. You're throwing out these big numbers, 30,000 cells, single cells, and it's key, I think, uh... And that's what's amazing about biology, right? You need 30,000 cells to capture the heterogeneity that's present in any biological system. Um, but it's daunting, right? And I think one cornerstone of the approach is the incorporation of these high numbers of replicates across many platforms into this kind of meta-analysis, right? And counterintuitively, that kind of meta-analysis can provide a deep insight into the whole system, uh, both in these physiological or pathological conditions. And that's the resource, but it doesn't seem like it'll be possible, you know, notwithstanding the, the savvy of the, the people who created this thing, but moving forward, it's hard for me to envision really gleaning all the deep insights without some measure of like AI, right? And I think as we move forward, you'll see AI taking a, a larger and larger hand in the analysis. I, I just recently read this story about how AI is gleaning patterns in deep math that didn't ever even occur to our tiny puny little flesh lobes that we call brains um and to me it's weird because it conjures this kind of twilight zone vibe or planet of the apes i don't know what you want to call it where like we're these test monkeys who are just implementing the experiments that are for the ai to design and then interpret and we're just you know pipettes um I mean, obviously that's that's far from the truth, but I mean, what what are the real limitations of root? I mean, you weigh in on this. I'm sure you've thought big picture. What are the the, the real limitations of AI right now? Um, are they surmountable, you know, to the point of like Planet of the Apes stage where I should be gearing up for a late career postdoc working for a PI that's an AI? Tell me, what do you think, Ru? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I mean, that's a big topic, right? Because AI is being used almost every place we look in right now. Um, so I'm going to focus it more to what we are doing and how we are doing it. And I want to just add on to what Caitlin described so well. Yes, we needed to look at the tens of thousands of cells to kind of convince ourselves that there was really no obvious correlation between these genes we expected to change along with the organization. But as we are doing this more and more, 
I don't think we're necessarily going to need that many cells to have the same insight. Mm. So to your point, what are the limitations if you come up with the unexpected? So our hypothesis going into this paper was that gene expression could predict organization and organization can be a, a very early proxy of downstream function and maturation but we were our hypothesis was wrong i mean it wasn't 100 percent wrong if you look at the population the trends were there but this idea that in a given cell that you could predict one thing from the other and that's what ai is can you predict x based on y right mm -hmm. um and I think it's really important to think of what is the question and to create training data that is robust and really trustable to get at that insight. So because of all the things we already discussed, creating those cell lines that are so highly QC'd and consistent, and at the same time, we have similar uh, standards around our microscopy, how we image these cells and what are the constraints there. Once you have a good training set, then it's an iterative process. You have to predict X, then you have to test it. You have to predict Y, you test it, you tweak it. And you need human brains to do that still. <laughs> um, and even in our paper, we had humans, and Caitlin was one of those expert humans, who went and tested some of those models uh, in terms of our quantitation for our organization score. Um, so I do think we have to be careful about what, you know, this machine learning everything provides us, but you have to have constraints and it has to be iterative. Uh, but the training data is really key. And then, yes, maybe you can get bolder and bolder down the road. So that's kind of our thinking right now, because once we build those frameworks, for quantifying whatever we're looking at, we found out in other cases, oh, you don't need 100,000 cells. We can see it actually in 500 cells, but we would have never believed it with 500 cells, mm -hmm. right? I see. Yeah, I think uh, I wanted to really emphasize one point that you made, which was the importance of a good training data set. And I think that's a major limitation with a lot of current studies is that, you know, perhaps the, the training data set they're using to, you know, introduce into your machine learning algorithms and your AI data sets, is, it's not adequate. And so it, to simplify garbage in, garbage out. Right? Correct. So you really have to make sure that training data set is good. And I think with the, the tremendous expertise that you have at the Allen Institute when it comes to actually the basic science and making sure that the stem cell biology and the cell biology is good, then I think you have, uh, you're more reassured that the downstream data set is going to look good too, right? Correct. So, and hopefully yeah. down the road that it will get easier because right now it's very challenging. It, do, it does take a lot of resources and you can take one training set and apply it to some other data. We've tried, and in some cases it works if the, if what you, the measurements are very, very similar. But you, unfortunately, you can just use someone else's training data set and then have your experiment and expect a good prediction. So we have to be very, very uh, careful that we don't misinterpret the findings. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I feel like, and myself included, people hear AI and they think that like the same thing that Magical. drives your Tesla is going to yeah. come now and look in the microscope and be like, that cell is a cardiomyocyte. But obviously, yeah. Yeah. Um, these are all systems that are really early, early in their development. But maybe um, we'll get there, right? <laughs> yes. one, day. one day, hopefully. Uh, I mean, if it's anyone that's going to get us there, it's you two. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. Before we let you go, uh, we have a couple of uh, peripheral questions um, that we'd like to ask you. First to you, Rue, what's the best piece of advice, either professional or not, that you've uh, been given? I can think of two. Uh, the first one I think holds really true during some of these very challenging times we've all undergone with the pandemic. That is do something you love to do and something you are naturally good at or get excited about or uh, is true to your values. Uh, and I think that's really true for a lot of us in the Institute. 
that we love what we do and we are driven by it because of the bigger mission. So if you enjoy it, it's not work. I think we've all heard that in some way or the other. Uh, and that's advice I got very, very early on that still trade very true. Another one I got when I was a postdoc, which was very exciting, and you know, I was nervous about going into industry. I thought it was a one way street, turns out it's not, um, is, is to make, what, what was that uh, this person said? They said, make yourself indispensable wherever you are at. Mm. <laughs> and don't worry about anything else. If you're really good and indispensable, uh, don't worry about, you know, what's going to happen next. And I think that's actually been true to looking back. That reminds me of a great quote from this obscure movie that uh, with uh, Kevin Spacey. So I don't know, maybe it's been canceled, but it's called Swimming with Sharks, where Kevin Spacey is this awful, irascible boss. And he says this line, it's actually true and poignant. He says, if, if they can't start the meeting without you, then maybe that's a meeting you got to get to. <laughs> um, and I think that's it's a similar idea. Um, Caitlin, we got a, a bit of a series for you. Uh, fill in the blanks. I love the fill in the blanks here. First, when I am not conducting research, I am. Uh, I, you can find me out running on the trails in the mountains. Um, when I'm, <laughs> yeah, when, I, when I'm not in the lab, actually, I'm also a professional trail and ultra runner. And so I uh, spend a lot of time kind of uh, just out, out and about outside running. You're being humble. I mean, you don't yes. just run, you win. You win <laughs> ultra marathons. You place first in a bunch of these. You're always on the podium. You're in fact sponsored by uh, the North Face. You're one of the North Face's athletes. Yeah, I did a little bit of research on you. <laughs> I think it's always interesting when you have uh, exceptional minds on this show for one reason, and then you have they have these exceptional characteristics. I, I'm always curious about you know if there's a common denominator between the the ultra marathoning and the, the your efforts at the Allen Institute. I'm guessing yeah, it's a, it's a long run. Each one of those, it's a slog, right? So I could see the yep. symmetry there. That's nice. Um, uh, can I add one one thing yes, quick? Of course. Two two things. Uh, I noticed like Rue has also said this to me sometimes. Like sometimes we're in a sprint and sometimes we're in a marathon, and it depends on like what project we're at and where we're at in it. Um, but those analogies come in. And one uh, you know kind of interesting common denominator there is just the problem solving. Like when you're uh, you know I think fundamentally as scientists and engineers we're we're always solving problems and we've got a set of constraints and we've got a goal and we're trying to figure out how to get there um, and I you know I think about that actually a lot when I'm running as well for the listeners we're talking about 100 mile races so for me the problem that I'm trying to solve there is how to stay alive but uh, <laughs> okay, Caitlin's got some other more logistical things that she's considering um, all right. Next, if I could have this is you, Kaylin, if I could have one superpower, it would be I mean, you already have that one superpower that we just talked about, but ha have another. What would it be? Uh, I would love to be able to fly. I know that's probably a not that exciting superpower, but that's one that like I always think about. <laughs> it's not enough to be an ultra runner. You got to fly now, yeah. too. Jeez. Uh, all right. I can't start the day without blank. Uh, can't start without coffee and an extra five minutes of snoozing with my dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Um, well, you know, take your minutes, take your time, get a snuggle because uh, we need you back in the lap on the long run. And Ruth, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you too, Caitlin. This has been a real fun chat. Um, we hope to, to see you soon and see the next reporter line coming off the pipe. I mean, it really is actually exciting. I have to say for myself, you tune into these things because it's like coming soon. And then you have like, you're just waiting to see what the, what the next line will be, because maybe it, it's, uh, you know, maybe it crosses paths with your line of research. So guys, after you listen to this, go check out the website and browse. It's a lot of fun. Thanks again, guys, for joining us. Thank you both. This was really fun. And thank you for inviting us. And I just want to add that our excitement is very small when we re release a line. It's really big when we see how many people are using the lines because it's now in 25 or 30 countries and we've released like close to 2000 vials. 
It's just every part of the body is being worked on with our cell life. So that's really rewarding to us. And that's when we get super excited. When we release, we're a little nervous. But when we hear about like you, uh, Arun, when you mentioned you use them, that's, that's when we get excited and feel like, okay, we've done something. Well, I guarantee you, Paul Allen is somewhere smiling. So you guys have done your job. I hope so. He does. Uh, he does inspire us even when, while he's gone. All right. That brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. This is the first episode of 2022, and it is the first episode where my partner is on his own officially independent investigator. So guys, tune in to his website. I'm sure he's hiring. Check it out and get ready for some papers because he's got a backlog. He's going to come out with a ton of things. I can't wait to read it.